Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eva Girgina, and I'm part of the marketing team here at Industrial Sauna Mechanics. I will be today's webinar's uh, host. We're going to discuss a very popular topic today, the commercial production of the so-called water-soluble CBD and THC. Uh, we get a lot of questions on this topic. The presentation will be done by Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky. Uh, before I hand over the mic to Alexei, I'd like to go over a few webinar details. We'll be running a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you'd like to submit your questions to the presenter, please type them into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom uh, window. As time allows, we'll address as many questions as we can during the Q&A session. Uh, since this is a technical uh, scientific webinar and we have over 400 people, we'll focus on the technical questions. Um, if you have any business related questions, on the other hand, uh, please submit them either through our website, uh, sonomechanics.com, or you can also email contact at sonomechanics.com. If um, any questions are left unanswered, we'll do our best to answer them offline after the event and we'll publish them on our blog. We'll also be recording the webinar. So we'll share a link to the recording on our blog as well, as soon as it's available. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky. He is the co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer of industrial sauna mechanics. Dr. Peshkovsky received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from University of Pennsylvania and PhD in physical chemistry from Columbia University. His professional experience includes over 25 years as a researcher, entrepreneur, product developer, and scientific director, mainly focusing on instrumentation design and process development for the medical physics, pharmaceutical, and cannabis industries. He is also the author of over 40 scientific papers, patents, conference presentations, and books. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we look forward to your questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, many thanks for, for joining. I recognize many names. Um, welcome. Uh, I will talk about uh, water-soluble CBD and THC. Um, there are cannabis extract nanoemulsions, but it's typical for people to call them water-soluble CBD and THC. I will uh, discuss uh, their benefits, um, basic formulation and production principles, how they can be produced in an industrial setting, so commercial production of them. Um, their main properties, what to watch out for, uh, some rules of thumb, some tips and tricks. And um, uh, I will conclude with some pharmacokinetic study, uh, preclinical -clin pre uh, pharmacokinetic study results that, uh, that we have that uh, compare their performance to, to typical uh, formulations. Um, I'm sure everyone here knows that uh, there are many different ways of bringing cannabis into the bloodstream. It could be consumed orally, digestively, uh, as an edible, for example, or a gel cap with an oil solution of uh, CBD or THC. It could be uh, smoked or vaped or dabbed, so pulmonary route using your, uh, your lungs. It could be uh, brought in through mucous membranes, so sublingual, intranasal, ocular, even rectal exists, uh, or it could be transdermal through the skin. So uh, all these methods coexist and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for example, oral digestive is very convenient and discreet, but it's extremely slow and very inefficient and unreliable. Pulmonary is quick, uh, but it's harsh and sometimes dangerous, and that's because we've evolved our lungs to bring oxygen to the bloodstream and not cannabis. They're, they don't have the 
the measures of control and safety that the digestive tract has, uh, because you're basically tricking your body into bringing a substance that is not really meant to go into your body that way. So when a formulation of a vape juice goes south, then you, you can have some serious issues, as uh, everyone knows that recently happened. Um, sublingual routes are good for some things, but they're also uh, inconvenient um, sometimes. And uh, sublingual is um, of the different types of um, uh, these types of uh, routes is probably the most convenient. It's easier to put something under your tongue than to spray it in your nose or use an ocular method or a rectal method, but um, they are coupled to a oral digestive um, method because saliva washes things down your, your throat. And so these things are unreliable frequently and um, also um, pretty harsh and inconvenient sometimes. And transdermal is just really slow and very inefficient. So the main question then is, why do all these methods coexist? Why do they, um, why don't they go away in favor of a winner? Why isn't there one method that just works well? Um, and the argument that I'd like to make in this talk is that that is because cannabis is not water soluble. And if it were water soluble, then um, I believe, and I will try to make the argument in this, in this presentation that most of these methods, if not all of them, would just not survive in favor of a beverage consumption method or similar routes like that. In fact, there is a very good example of a substance that is bioactive and is water soluble and is in many ways similar to cannabis, except that it's water soluble, which is the alcohol, um, which is alcohol. And the alcohol industry doesn't use a vaping, dabbing, sublingual, you know, um, all these different methods because you could just have a drink and you know exactly what the drink will do. So you know what a glass of wine is, you know, how long it will last on an empty stomach versus full stomach. Maybe there's a difference, but it's easy to predict what's going to happen. And the bioavailability is very high and it's quick. So if you could administer cannabis that way, why wouldn't you always just do that? So let's consider this further. Uh, skipping kind of really forward. Um, I want to show you that it does exist and many of you um, of course, know that it, that it exists, and this is what it looks like when you make cannabis water compatible and put it in a beverage. In this case, I'm going to show you what happens when you put it in just clear water because that's the toughest case um, because water is transparent. So if there's something in it that doesn't exactly dissolve in it or, or that is not very compatible with it, then you'll see it there. So. On the right, you will see a liquid nano emulsion concentrate. Uh, on the left, you will see also a nano emulsion, but in its solid form, and uh, it's, in, it's in a solid powder form. So when you add these things to water, and in both cases, we're adding a 10 milligram dose of CBD. So you can see that once you give it a stir, they both disappear. So this is a good way to distinguish a good product from a not so good product. If a product makes your water milky, or in the case of powder, if you see something floating in there or something selling to the, uh, uh, some sedimentation or, or sparkles or, or physical objects that you can see that didn't go in, that simply means that you're not, um, um, using a formulation that produces nanoparticles and all the consequences of having correctly prepared nanoparticles, which is the bioavailability increase and the onset of action time reduction, all of these things don't happen unless you have a formulation that goes clear once you put it in, um, in water. I will, I will explain why. But um, to understand what matter emulsions are, let's first talk about surfactants. So what is a surfactant? I will not be too technical about this. And 
this looks maybe a little scary, <laughs> but uh, we we don't have to deal with it in too much detail. So this is a surfactant. This is specifically twin 80 or polysorbate 80. It's a very typical, very standard surfactant that actually works pretty well for making nanomulsions, except I wouldn't recommend it because it's kind of harsh and very bitter, but it works from the chemical perspective. So let's look at this part of it. This has lots of oxygens and hydrogens and is actually a type of sugar. So this is a head that is water soluble because it's a type of sugar, it's a sorbate. Now, on this end, you have a hydrocarbon chain and that is compatible with oils. So it's actually an oil, it's an oleic uh, acid derivative, olive oil basically derivative. So when you put this sugar head on a hydrophobic, which is oil compatible, oil loving tail, and schematically I'm gonna represent it like this, you have a substance that wants to dissolve in water with its head and in oil with its tail. So when you have both, so we're gonna put some oil on top of water, and if you put some surfactant in there, it's gonna go right onto the interface. And that's the whole point of its existence. It puts its head into water and its tail is sticking to the oil. So when you look at it from the oil's perspective, you're seeing a bunch of oil-friendly tails. From the water perspective, you're seeing a bunch of water-friendly heads. So now oil and water don't hate each other as much because their interface has this fence that looks attractive to both parties. So what surfactants do, long story short, is they make oil and water more compatible with each other and they relax the interface. So the interface is not so tense, if you will. Now, using this principle, uh, there are several types of formulations that are um, water compatible oil formulations that can be made. Um, and I wanna go through these formulations and introduce nanoemulsions at the end and explain the difference between nanoemulsions and all the rest. So the first and the, the most typical is macroemulsion or just emulsion. So uh, this comprises large droplets of oil, water on the outside, and the, the interface is covered with surfactant and you can do that by just basically taking an oil, maybe with cannabis pre-dissolved in it, or just straight cannabis oil, water, some surfactant, tween 80, for example, or even dish soap, and not exactly food grade, but it will work. Uh, by the way, that's why you can wash uh, dirty hands, oily, greasy hands with soap and water. You can't just wash them with water because water doesn't dissolve the oil away, but with soap it will. So the soap will bind to oil and to water and just get off your hands. So if you take oil, water, and some basic surfactant and whip it up, uh, apply some basic stirring or shear or like a rotostator, uh, rotostator type equipment, uh, so shear equipment, you will get a milky white, and it's milky because milk is, is this, milk is, is an emulsion. So you'll get a milky um, sort of water compatible oil uh, entity. Now, this entity is not stable. If you give it time, sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's a day, but they will separate, they're not stable. Uh, and they don't really provide the benefits that we're hoping for from what people like to call water soluble cannabis. Um, so we'll not consider them uh, further in this, in this presentation. There is another type of formulation which is very tricky and, and misunderstood in many cases. It's called microemulsion. Well, first of all, this is a misnomer. Microemulsion kind of refers to micro something, but there's nothing micro about it. It's actually nanoparticles, nano-sized particles. So some people erroneously call these nanoemulsions and they're actually not. They're microemulsions or micellar suspensions. Uh, an interesting thing about them is they don't require any equipment to produce. The way that they're made is you basically overwhelm the, the water base, the water, kind of continuous phase, 
with so much surfactant, uh, different types of surfactant, carefully selected, and co-solvents in many cases, basically with chemicals, so much that it's no longer really water. And that, that solvent is able to solubilize oil. So the oil goes into it, and in some cases it will form this kind of a weird bicontinuous a system where oil and water coexist, and you can't really see them, so it goes pretty clear. Or, in other cases, you can make this micellar suspension. So these are actually nano droplets of oil surrounded by surfactant. Uh, they're spontaneously formed by just having a huge axis of, of this surfactant in solution. So the heads like water, but the tails don't, and so the tails kind of find each other, and they form these micelles. And then if you have any other oil, like cannabis oil or whatever, that will find its way into the interior because that's where it's happier. So you make nano emulsion type droplets that way. But in order to, to sustain this, the rest of it has to be overwhelmed by a lot of surfactant, uh, which means that you will get the benefits uh, of uh, bioavailability increase and, and uh, um, onset time uh, reduction but at the expense of co-administering uh, harsh uh, surfactants um, and co-solvents and other things into the body. Uh, in reality, you typically get a little bit of both. So I, I put one picture over, over the other. So you get a little bit of micelles and you get this uh, bicontinuous structure and lots of surfactants floating around. This type of formulation was used extensively by the pharmaceutical companies in the past um, to deliver drugs into the bloodstream, so it works. Uh, and they are switching out of it, and they've been switching out of it for the past 15 years when nanoemulsions um, came into play, because as you will see, you get the benefits without the, the problems when you use nanoemulsions instead of this. The next formulation is liposomal suspension. This is another very misunderstood and a very cool type of uh, formulation. So it works, it's great, um, but it's not really for cannabis delivery. Uh, the reason that it's not is because, as you can see, uh, it has water on the outside. It has water on the inside, water on the inside. And the oil is only in the membrane, in the skin. And it's exaggerated. It's actually, relatively speaking, not as thick compared to the rest of the liposome. So, you can deliver water compatible, water soluble substances this way. For example, vitamin C, it's very typical to make vitamin C liposomes. Vitamin C dissolves in water just fine. But you sometimes want to put it in the liposome to, to control how it's gonna get released. Or if you're gonna be delivering very aggressive chemotherapy, it's good to put it in the liposome and deliver it into the bloodstream and it kind of stays there until it finds the organ and you can put special things into the skin of liposome so it finds the right organ and stays there and that's where the chemotherapy gets released so the side effects are mitigated. But for cannabis delivery, you would have to put it in this membrane and that's just not a very, um, not, not a very uh, significant loading factor. So many people actually call uh, cannabis formulation liposomal, but that's, that's, uh, that's not what those formulations typically are. They're typically either micro or, or nano emulsions. And liposomal, I'm not sure why people choose to call them that way, maybe because it sounds cool. I mean, it does sound cool, liposomal. But in most cases, they're actually not liposomes. Uh, and uh, nano emulsions, um, so nano emulsions is, uh, are the, relatively speaking, newer method, although nano emulsions are not really new. But as a drug delivery method, they're newer than these other methods. And as you can see, you get the same type of nano droplets without, uh, as you do in the case of micellar suspension. So these are basically micelles as well, but they do not require a lot, lots of extra surfactant everywhere. And that is because instead of using the chemical method of forcing the system to this kind of aqueous compatibility, you will be using mechanical energy. So there's a catch. You will not have extra surfactant. You will have excellent droplets. They will work very well. They will um, increase the bioavailability, reduce downside time. 
uh, they will be much more compliant and the choice of surfactants is much broader. You can use very mild, very food grade or, or natural surfactants. You can make translucent, becoming transparent formulations. But the catch is you need equipment. You need the right kind of equipment and not a lot of, so not many types of high shear equipment will be able to get you there. The advantage is, well, the disadvantage obviously is the cost of the, of the equipment. But you do save on surfactant costs. So in, in, in long run, uh, it's a big question what's cheaper, but um, it's much more mild and compliant because the mechanical energy that you use to create them doesn't linger in the finished product, unlike the extra surfactant that you put in, into microemulsions. Um, it's important to also say that microemulsions are believed to be more stable because they are thermodynamically stable. And it's true. If you leave them alone after you make them, they will not separate. But if you use them and put them in a beverage or change something about their conditions, they tend to separate uh, frequently. Nanoemulsions are kinetically stable. It's a different type of stability mechanism, but that makes it much more robust. So they don't depend on their environment. It's like a book on a shelf. So a book on a shelf is not stable. If the book wants to be on the floor, if you let it, if you remove the shelf or break the box, it will go on the floor. But if the box is strong and the shelf is strong, it will always stay there. So it's kinetic. Um, it's, it's a kinetic stabil stabiliza uh, stabilization uh, that happens in nanomulsions, and they survive practically unchanged for years. We have some nanomulsions we made three years ago and they haven't changed. And when you put them into different environments, they also tend to survive much better. Uh, pH, you know, things like that don't affect them as much. Let's take a close, closer look at nanomulsions. So a nanomulsion will typically have a carrier oil. Typically that would be a long chain triglyceride. So olive oil or co coconut oil or uh, a, a typical vegetable oil, but we don't recommend medium chain triglycerides. It's a bit too involved to explain why, but they don't work as well. Uh, they work very well for making nanoemulsions, but those nanoemulsions don't deliver uh, cannabis uh, as efficiently as they do with um, LCTs, long chain triglycerides. So that would be most of your formulation. Uh, there would be a bioactive, so that's your cannabis extract, or it doesn't actually have to be cannabis extract, it could be any oil compatible uh, bioactive substance. Then there would be uh, typically more than one surfactant if you do it right. And the amount of surfactant would be less than the amount of oil. Uh, we recommend using some mild preservatives uh, because fungus likes the stuff. So if you leave it open or if you um, open the bottle many times and dose it and, and um, you have some fungus in the air, it, it might grow in there. So and then to qualify as a nano emulsion, uh, D50, which is the median droplet size. So it's roughly speaking, it's about the, the center of your distribution, although it's not exactly the center, it's median. But it means 50% of your material is in the droplets that are smaller than this value, and 50% is in the droplets that is larger. So it's kind of the center by volume of your distribution. So if that is under 300 nanometers, then the formulation qualifies as a nano emulsion. Now, for, you, for this to be a good nano emulsion, it's recommended that D50, median droplet size, is well below 100 nanometers. And it just so happens that that also makes it translucent. So you can see it with the naked eye. And it's very convenient because you don't always need droplet size analysis equipment to know if you made a high quality product. If your product is milky white, then you don't know if you have 500 nanometers or 200 nanometers. But if it's translucent, then you know that all of your droplets are under 100. Now, ideally, uh, the, the value for D50 should be about 15 to 50 nanometers. We try to target about 25, maybe 30, somewhere in that vicinity. And if this is all fulfilled, then the bioavailability can be increased. Um, the absorption is much more efficient. It's very water compatible, goes into any water containing uh, product, any beverage. Uh, it's long, uh, it's stable long term. Uh, they can be translucent and they can be all natural, non toxic, food grade. Um, now, it's important to point out that nano emulsions themselves are not 
new. So the, the terminology and I'm using it deliberately for these kinds of purposes may be somewhat new, but we are surrounded by nano emulsions and we've always been. Uh, English breakfast tea, for example, is an excellent example of a nano emulsion that has the same droplet sizes that we always try to target in cannabis extract nano emulsions. So I'll show you the distribution for um, the cannabis extract nano emulsion, the one I showed in the video. Uh, the distribution is practically identical to English breakfast tea, and that's just tea oil with some naturally occurring surfactants in the in the tea that creates these droplets. And so you're having a cup of tea and you're drinking an emulsion. Actually, coffee is the same. So this is McDonald's coffee, very disciplined, nicely centered at, at, at 100 nanometers. This is beer. So beer has two types of droplets: very small micelles from some naturally occurring surfactant in there, and some nanomulsion droplets around 100. And there are many more examples. In fact, we um, ourselves, we produce mixed micelles to deliver anything into the bloodstream uh, from the small intestine or anything oil compatible. I'll talk about that later. And that's a type of nano emulsion as well. So uh, this is what it looks like for the actual nano emulsions, the same ones I showed previously. So this is the uh, liquid one. 20 milligrams per milliliter CBD extract, nanoemulsion liquid. Uh, the median is about 25 nanometers, 26. And this is what uh, you should um, expect for properly made uh, powder nanoemulsions, so solid ones, where the D50 is measured after you reconstitute it, meaning you take this and you put it into water. And then it goes back to being a nanoemulsion, and then you measure the droplets at that stage. And this is why it goes translucent, is because when it reconstitutes, all the droplets are below 100, so the animal is translucent, and when it's diluted, it, it, it looks completely transparent. Uh, this is a, a slightly closer look at what happens when um, you diminish the droplet sizes. So as you keep processing a nanomulsion, emulsion, the droplet size reduces. So this is what it looks like for 177 nanometers. So it's milky. 79, you can kind of maybe see something through it. So it's starting to be translucent. 49, it's translucent. 34 and 31 are near transparent. This is, by the way, published work. And here's a reference if you, um, if you need to uh, get details. Uh, it's all spelled out. Uh, but the main question, this is the center question, is what happens to the bioavailability as you reduce the droplet size? So this deserves some, some attention. Um, there is no study like this for cannabis extract nano emulsions that I know of yet. We are working on one, but it's very involved and so it takes some time, especially in the current situation, everything slowed down. But we are, um, hoping to be able to collect data in this direction within the next half a year, maybe, maybe a bit longer. But luckily, uh, the enhancement in, in the properties of absorption mainly belongs to the method and not so much to the active. Meaning if you take any kind of drug that is an oil, a vitamin, for example, an oil soluble vitamin, and you make a nano emulsion out of it, then relative to itself in the oil state, the bioavailability enhancement and other properties will increase because you've made a nano emulsion out of it. So if you do it for different drugs, roughly speaking, the enhancement is the same relative to, to a, the control, which is not nano emulsified. Obviously it's not exact, but the ballpark is about right. And we know this from the pharmaceutical industry that studies lots of drugs and has lots of money to do that. So they go through these very complex studies. And this is a very elegant study that was done on a typical oil compatible um, bioactive that was formulated as a nano emulsion at different droplet sizes. So they went from 400 nanometers to 25 nanometers and measured blood concentration as a function of time. It was administered orally, so very similar to what we're uh, dealing with 
uh, here. So if we look at these triangles, the black triangles, this is the bioavailability from a nanomulsion with 400 nanometer droplets. So this is basically right on the border between macro emulsion or just emulsion and a nanomulsion. And it's probably comparable to just consuming straight, straight oil as an edible. So this is roughly speaking an edible, maybe a little bit better than that. Now, once you reduce the droplets, the droplet sizes, you can see that when you're in, let's say, 200, 150 nanometer range, you have a significant improvement. However, when you get down below 100, there's a big jump. And the closer you get to 25, the, the 25 nanometers, the, the greater the improvement. And so at the very top here, there's 25. Uh, I will explain why, um, why this happens in the next slide. So this also deserves some attention because that kind of justifies the parameters that we always try to target and we advise other people to target, and this is why. So this is very busy and we don't have to get through all of this. Let's just look at the, the upper part here. When you consume an oil, uh, some, some type of fatty substance or just straight vegetable oil or, or whatever, with, with your meal. It arrives in your small intestine as large drops. Now, to get absorbed, these drops would have to get to the lining, to the absorption site, to, well, in, in parasite cells, lining your small intestine from the inside. But they can't do that because there's something called unstirred aqueous layer. There's a water layer that follows the, the lining that you have to get across, and it's not really moving the you know, unstirred aqueous layer, right? So oil not being water compatible can't travel through it. So what happens is um, phospholipids and bile salts uh, are generated internally in situ by the body, by the gallbladder, and they're surfactants. They're surfactant-like entities. They come and they together with some peristaltic motion that, that is always occurring in the small intestine, they make a basic emulsion from this large drop entity. The emulsion still can't get through the, the water layer, but the surface area to the oil from water is increased significantly. So now lipases come. Lipases are, uh, uh, they're enzymes that uh, will, pre-digest um, uh, triglycerides, which are oils. They remove glycerin group and they release free fatty acids from them. Now, free fatty acids, together with um, phospholipids and bile salts, assemble themselves into micelles. These are called mixed micelles. Now, these mixed micelles are just like the micelles I showed you before, or just like nanomulsion droplets, really. And they can now travel. These are water compatible. They're approximately uh, 10 to 25 nanometers in size, depending on what's inside. And if you have any uh, other oil that is not digestible, because it's not a triglyceride, let's say cannabis oil, it will find its way to the interior of these micelles and will be transported wherever, it, wherever these are going, which is typically here to the enterocyte cells. This is the inside of the inside surface of your small intestine, so they can get to where they need to be and they can get absorbed. And then several things can happen. They can go into the lymphatic fluid or to the bloodstream. This is beyond the scope of this talk. But the, the, the punchline basically to it is that this process of making micelles takes a long time and it's competitive with elimination. So you, it takes an hour to make, to, to even get to, to any, concentration of these. It takes a little bit more for them to start getting absorbed. So that's why everyone knows that if you consume an edible and you're supposed to consume it on a full stomach because these oils are needed to make it, to, to package it so it can be transported. So the oils co-administer it as the rest of the brownie, let's say that, that you took. Uh, all 
play a role. So it takes an hour for them to, to do anything. So you feel nothing for an hour. After hour and a half, some are coming in. So you're starting to feel something. After two hours, okay, they're coming in, but they're still being made. And so lots of people, if, if it's a THC product, they, they think they didn't take enough, then they take a second dose or something, then both doses hit you, then, then it's too much. So it's very unreliable, very delayed, and it competes with elimination and all kinds of other destru destructive processes. So the bioavailability is low, predictability is terrible, and the timing is, 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 is also terrible. Now, what if you just supply bees? Basically, what if you just consume an animalsin? Well, then you eliminate this whole process. You don't need it because what you consume is in a way pre-digested outside of your body uh, during production of the nanomotion. So as soon as it arrives there, it can just get absorbed. That's why the bioavailability is high because everything is packaged correctly. And the timing, uh, the onset time is very short because it's just ready to go. And this is, again, what we're seeing for nanomotion droplets that are properly prepared. They're about the same size as these micelles. This is ju the justification for the whole thing. Let's talk about how to make these. So um, you need to, two things. You need high shear equipment, ultrasonic system. So we offer bench, um, uh, lab bench and industrial scale systems. And to give you a sense of perspective, with our industrial system, uh, you can make 100,000 doses. If each dose is 10 milligrams of, let's say, CBD or THC, you can make 100,000 of those in an hour. So it's a very large production capacity. Lab system is about um, 25 times slower than that. And the bench scale system is about five times slower. So you can make 25,000 doses in an hour with that. That's just processing time, obviously prep and all that, that's extra time. The other side of the story is uh, the formulation. So we offer what we call nano stabilizer, where all the, um, ingredients that are necessary are pre-mixed. So carrier oil, all the surfactants, preservatives, uh, everything, everything that is necessary is already in it. And all you need to do is add your uh, cannabis extract, pre-mix it, put it with water into um, the ultrasound, uh, an ultrasonic system, uh, run it and watch for translucency. When it's properly translucent, you filter it and collect it. And that's essentially the entire process. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so all the required research and development is already in here. Now, how does this work? Why does ultrasound create the shear forces that reduce the droplet size? So this is what happens inside, so let me go back. So inside this reactor chamber, some people call it flow cell, there is an entity called ultrasonic horn. It's in here. This is the tip. So this is kind of what happens inside. And the white cloud here, that's cavitation cloud. So cavitation is the formation of vacuum bubbles as this thing, this thing, the, the tip of the horn is moving up and down. You can't see it because it's, it's very fast and, and very small, relatively speaking, amplitude. But uh, on the upstroke, it makes vacuum bubbles that grow to critical size, and then they collapse on themselves. They implode. And when they implode, they create microjets. So this very tiny uh, submicron size uh, jet of water will hit anything that's near it, including droplets, and break them into smaller droplets. And it will just hit it until uh, the droplets are comparable to um, what, what this uh, shear field can achieve, which um, basically means the more intense the, the field, the smaller the droplet size. So with the right high amplitude, uh, which translates to high uh, cavitation intensity, you will get down to the droplet size that you intend to get down to. This is what a typical system looks like. This is a bench scale system. Uh, so it, it has some basic components. There's a generator, transducer. This is a flow cell I was talking about. This is where the premix is, and it recirculates through it until it's done. 
Uh, and again, uh, there are three levels of systems. So LSP 600 is a lab scale system that's good for uh, research and development. And then medium scale system is good for medium sized production. And this is typically for larger production um, for industrial scale production. This is what nano stabilizer looks like. And again, this is an all-in-one formulation. It's all uh, pre-mixed uh, pre for you. Uh, it yields very high, uh, highly translucent nano emulsions with, with the benefits that we've talked about. Requires no expertise, comes with instructions, and comprises only very mild food-grade components that are all, all derived from natural sources. A very typical question that we receive is, uh, how much nanostabilizer should I use with, um, with my CBD or extract or my THC extract? So we typically recommend five to one. And remember that most of it is a carrier oil. Um, so when you use it at five to one, you, will, um, you should be able to get a uh, product that looks like this. This is a 20 milligrams per milliliter CBD isolate nano emulsion. You can see that it's highly translucent. And if you go straight up here, the D50 median droplet size is 27 nanometers. And the upper, the green curve, is um, 52 nanometers. So this is the upper edge of the distribution. Now, you can use less, or you can use more, but it doesn't really give you uh, additional benefits. But if you go to four to one, you're still very much okay, so that's okay. If you can uh, give up a little bit of translucency, and this is not a problem typically because when you put it in the beverage, it will go transparent anyway. But when you get down to something like five and a half to one, oh, sorry, two and a half to one, the droplet size here is, um, is still good, but the upper edge of the distribution is now above 100. So you're losing translucency pretty quickly. And if you go to below two to one, the upper edge of the distribution is approaching to 220 nanometers. And that's a problem because you need to filter these things for sterility before you collect them. And the filter is sterilizing filter, has 220 nanometer pore sizes. So you want to be far from this number. We don't recommend that anyone goes down um, below two and a half to one. So anywhere between five and five to one and two and a half to one is okay. As you make this product, the translucency goes up. So you recirculate this thing and this is what happens to the distribution. It, it starts out on the right and then it progresses down and then uh, the translucency follows. So as you're making it, you can draw samples and they are more translucent with time. Uh, stability is a typical question. So stability as far as droplet sizes and the, the, the way that nano emulsion uh, separates or doesn't separate, uh, that is permanent. Um, we have nano emulsions, as I said, that we've made years ago and they, uh, they're still intact. Uh, but chemical stability is another uh, issue. So if you have um, a nano emulsion of something that is sensitive to light, for example, which is CBD, then it will, it will be sensitive to light. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's an emulsion. It's just CBD is sensitive to light and it gets oxidized. So we don't recommend using clear glass unless you keep that in the dark. Um, this is what happens if you compare dark glass container with clear glass container. So for about half a year, they're about the same. And this was in the lab, kind of in the corner. So ambient light, but not direct sunlight or anything like that. So for about half a year, they're, they're about the same. But then after that, CBD uh, starts to oxidize and turns red. Uh, in a dark container, it just keeps going. Um, and as promised, I, I want to talk about uh, some preclinical pharmacokinetic study results that we have. And this deserves uh, a little bit of attention because it's a busy slide. So let me explain what, what, what we did here. We compared two formulations. One was 10 milligrams of THC dissolved in MCT oil in a capsule that was swallowed. That was control. Uh, the other formulation was the same dose, 10 milligrams of THC, nano emulsified, administered in water 
100 milliliters of water, people just drank it. And everyone took each formulation on a full stomach and on a separate occasion on an empty stomach. So there are four graphs uh, resulting from this. And let's start with the simplest one. So this green one, or oh, what is this color? I guess it's light blue. Let's call it light blue. So this light blue one is a basically an edible a oil capsule consumed on a full stomach. Everyone is familiar with this shape. For a couple hours, there's nothing. Then it starts to come in. Three and a half hours, it peaks, and then it goes out. And this tail actually lingers on for, for a long time. So on the vertical, this was self-reported high, how high people felt, uh, averaged over 15 volunteers. So we got up to about five on this dose. It wasn't a very high dose. Now, um, this is a very familiar shape. Now, if you take the same formulation on an empty stomach, this is the red curve. And uh, it's a bit more complex here. So the um, initial peak was uh, faster, under two hours, but it was very low. So people barely felt. So one is when you kind of maybe feel something. Two is like, okay, I feel something, but, but not much. So this is how high they got. And that makes sense because you need to co-administer fats with an edible. So it kind of peaked and then it was going away and then we allowed people to have a meal and it came back, which shows that it's there. It just doesn't go in until you give it food. So you get the second bump, even if you eat much later. So it's, it's kind of anecdotal, but it's important to, to know this. Now, the green and the purple are nano emulsions. So the purple is nano emulsion on a full stomach. You can see that it was felt after 15 minutes or so. It got up in one hour to its maximum. Then it stayed relatively flat. And then the bioavailability, the area under the curve was pretty high and the intensity was above six. And then it was gone after about five hours completely. The green is the same on an empty stomach. And this is much closer to alcohol. The reasons for that, and unfortunately I don't have time to get into these reasons, but this was felt even quicker. It got up to its maximum in less than an hour, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes, then it stayed flat. And then it quickly went out and after four hours it was gone. This is what a glass of wine looks like, maybe a bit more than a glass of wine. But it's reversed, interestingly. And this is the difference. So I'm kind of driving this to show that if you make cannabis water compatible, water soluble, it will act more, a lot more like alcohol in a predictable fashion. But there's this one exception. It, it is reversed in, in, the, in terms of full versus empty stomach. Alcohol hits you harder on an empty stomach. Cannabis, even nano emulsify, hits you somewhat harder on a full stomach. But both are there for sure. And this reversal may be important for product manufacturers just so that they can advise people how to um, administer this product. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope we can have some nanomalsion drinks. I will take any uh, questions you might have. All right, we'll go ahead and get some of these questions answered now. We have a lot of good ones. <laughs> I like good ones. <laughs> so, um, the first question we have is, at what temperatures do the nano emulsions break down and become unstable? So, when you make them properly, they can typically be almost boiled. So, if you bring them up to 90 Celsius, but you don't let them evaporate, because if you let them evaporate, they will form a skin, just like milk does. That's just because water gets out and oil stays behind, and so now you broke it because you've, you've actually decomposed it. Physically. But if you just raise the temperature, they typically survive up until about 90, 95 degrees. But when you boil them, they tend to separate. Uh, on, the, 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 on the opposite direction, you can keep them as cold as you want. But if you freeze them and thaw them, they also tend to not necessarily separate, but the droplet sizes increase. And if you do it a couple of times, they will separate. Okay, great. 
Uh, regarding shelf life, how long does it take for homogeneity to break down? Would this be similar to orange juice where it needs to be shaken to have particles properly dispersed? Not, not, not if it's a nano emulsion. So micro, um, macro emulsions are just simple emulsions do need to be shaken. So when your product says shake me, or if it's conveniently in a non see-through container, chances are it's a macro emulsion that probably separated, but if you shake it, you temporarily put it back. So you can shake it before you drink it and then it will be kind of out of the container and in you, but it doesn't have the right size droplets for all these uh, benefits to occur. So those are not stable. Nano emulsions are permanently stable. You don't have to shake them, you don't have to do anything, and they last for years. The next question is, does filtration change the milligram per milliliter ratio? Um, assume that means potency. That's a great question. So it doesn't if all your droplets are smaller than the pores of the filter, which is how, the, how it should be. And if your droplets are comparable or larger than uh, the, the pores of the filter, you could still force it through. Some, some, um, I, I've seen people do that. So they say, okay, this is how the nanomulsion looks like now. It's not translucent, but look, we, we're going to push it with this pump through a filter and now it's translucent. Okay, well, the portion that was smaller in terms of droplet sizes got through. The rest didn't. So now your potency, who knows what it is. Maybe there's nothing in it. Maybe it's transparent because it's just water. Typically, they just clog the filters. So uh, short answer is, if you make it right, it doesn't notice the filter. It goes some fairly easily through it, and it doesn't notice it in the sense that nothing, nothing changes after it goes through, except if there were some so if, if there's some dust from the air, if there's uh, any kind of other particular contamination or bacteria or microorganism or anything, that will not go through. Uh, the next question is, has anyone found a successful method for analyzing cannabinoid content in a nano emulsion? Of course, um, HPLC can do this. Uh, you just need to remember to use a water compatible mobile phase, which is the solvent that is sent through the column, uh, typically methanol. So if your lab is unable to get stable results from a nano emulsion, it, it could be one of two things. Either the nano emulsion is just not good and different parts of the product have different potency, or the lab doesn't know how to do this. So uh, generally, if you tell them to use a methanol mobile phase, then uh, the results will stabilize. Excellent. Uh, we've heard that some cannabis beverages packaged in cans have lost their potency quickly due to some reaction with the can lining. Are you aware of this? this and are question. there, yeah, are there issues in packaging choices for nano emulsions? This is a great question, and uh, we're expecting to publish something on this. It's a very typical question. Uh, so um, here's what I can kind of squeeze into this short answer. Um, it does happen sometimes. It depends on the formulation and on the lining of the can. Uh, also, it depends on the rest of the beverage. The reason for that is cans are lined with something that is hydrophobic. It's oil compatible, but it's not water compatible. It's typically done to prevent aluminum to, from leaching into the beverage. So it's an oil and the droplets have oil inside. So they could prefer the lining to the rest of water. So if the nanomulsion is made very well, Typically that doesn't happen, but even then it might, depending on the type of lining. Now, if it does happen, there are ways to deal with it. Uh, you basically need to passivate the surface. Um, I can't get into it too much, but um, uh, we have encountered this. We've solved it for, for some customers before, but it doesn't always happen. It's important to know that it's not necessarily gonna happen. So first, it's important to demonstrate that you're seeing this effect. And if you are seeing this effect, there are ways to deal with it. Uh, next question is, what is the advantage of using nano stabilizer versus fan 80 uh, polysorbate 80 composition? So tween 80 and span 80 uh, and surfactants like this polysorbates, 
will get you to the right droplet size. Maybe not quite 25. Uh, they tend to end at about 50, maybe 60 nanometers, but that's pretty decent. The problem is they're very harsh. They are bitter. Uh, they, uh, there's some limitations on how much you can ingest. Uh, so it's not as clean, but it's food grade. They're, they're all food grade. And so if your beverage permits for whatever uh, uh, effects uh, there are from them, bitterness and whatever, but in, in some cases, it's not a problem. Or if it's a topical, then it's not a problem necessarily, at least not taste-wise. Then those are great. You just need to optimize the formulation properly and you are able to use them. For neutral tasting beverages, um, they're typically not the right choice. Great. Um, can you over sonicate in terms of time and amplitude? Will it destroy it, the cannabis extract and cannabinoids? It's difficult to over sonicate. Uh, you could um, you could create a problem by processing too intensely or too long, but it would be a secondary effect. For example, if your amplitude is higher than necessary, uh, you will deposit more heat into the substance than necessary. And that sometimes is not good. You could be drawing air. If it's very vigorous, you could draw air bubbles from the environment into your mixture and that will create foam, uh, put too much oxygen into it and oxidize something or just interfere with processing because air doesn't, do, you're supposed to be processing a liquid, not a foam. Uh, you are also um, slowly destroying, you're, you're, you're contributing some of the particles from the horn. If you're using it very intensely, there are some titanium particles that get deposited into the formulation, which you're, are very easy to filter out and they get filtered out automatically once you do the sterile filtration. But if you really over process, then you're stressing the system. You're damaging the components beyond what's necessary. Otherwise, it doesn't typically happen. So it's pretty tolerant to overprocessing, both in terms of time and intensity. How does industrial sonic mechanics uh, equipment compare to other ultrasonic systems? So there's a um, there, there's one main difference between our equipment and other ultrasonic equipment. We use uh, what we call barbell horn ultrasonic technology. We developed it for the pharmaceutical industry that needed to scale up their processes without losing the intensity. Uh, it um, actually I have a slide on that. Let's 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 go to that slide. Here it is. So on a lab scale. A horn looks like this. It has a small tip, typically. And if you're processing 30 milliliters at a time, 50 milliliters at a time, not much more than that, this type of horn works because it can create a high amplitude. The way it creates the high amplitude is basically by going from a large diameter to a small one. So it's an amplification based on that. But when a conventional ultrasonic system is scaled up, this amplitude is lost. It's uh, a fundamental problem of ultrasonic technology that's always been around until the introduction of the barbell horn technology. Though the whole, our company basically was created around the invention of the barbell horn. And what you're trying to avoid is this. When you scale up, go to production anywhere above 50 milliliters or so at a time, the amplitude is lost. And so the results are gone. You're not gonna get the right droplet sizes. So what you want, is to scale up and not lose the amplitude. And this is what you get with our technology. So long story short, our lab horns and our industrial horns vibrate at the same amplitude. And we're not aware of anyone else who is able to do that. Uh, we have another question. Does the viscosity of the cannabis oil play a factor in production? Typically it does not because you would be dissolving it in nano stabilizer, or if you're using your own formulation, then you would be dissolving it in the carrier oil, which we always recommend that you, that you do. Once that happens, uh, the viscosity is completely, uh, the viscosity of the carrier oil essentially takes over. Therefore, it doesn't matter how you start it. You could start with a solid CBD isolate with a very viscous 
extract, whether you distill it, it doesn't matter what you start with, you always end up with roughly the same viscosity after it's in the carrier oil. And from there, the process is always the same. Um, we have another question. What is the maximum loading of CBD in the nano emulsion? In order to keep it translucent, we don't recommend exceeding about 50 milligrams per milliliter. So that's five doses in one milliliter, considering 10 milligrams of, as a dose. Uh, you could go a little higher, uh, maybe 60 or 70, but if you go much higher, then translucency is lost. So if translucency, well, it, 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 it's not exactly lost, it just diminish, it diminishes as you go up in concentration. So uh, the main question is, do you need this to be translucent? If you don't, then you can get up to 15% or so easily, 150 milligrams per milliliter. You could even probably go higher than that. If you want it to be translucent, we don't recommend that you exceed 50 milligrams per milliliter or 5%. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, explain high shear requirements in greater detail. Is this always necessary to create a nano emulsion? It's always necessary to create a nano emulsion. It's not always necessary to create um, a water compatible cannabis formulation because you could go the micro emulsion route. So the micro emulsion route is the route where you use a lot of extra surfactant to drive the process forward, and if that's acceptable to you, then you can get away with a lot less shear or even no shear sometimes. The shear replaces the chemicals, if you will. So the great, the better your um, ultrasonic system, the, the, the greater the intensity that you are able to create uh, of the shear in your formulation, the milder the product, if you will. So if you're making a translucent nano emulsion, yes, you do need high shear. Okay, and I think this will have to be the last question. Uh, are there different variations of your premix? Uh, I assume that's nano stabilizer. Of nano stabilizer. Um, they, they can be, uh, we don't find it to be necessary typically because, and actually um, I should have mentioned it, so thank you for reminding me. Nano stabilizer is broad spectrum. It will work for many things without needing to be reformulated. That was one of the main things about it. So it could be used on isolates, extracts, distillates, not even cannabis things, essential oil mixes, whatever. Uh, it typically works the same way for all of these things. Now, there are special cases. There are situations where people need something specific. And if that requires uh, reformulating, then we're obviously we're able to do it. It's just a question of um, what needs to be done. We need to understand all the requirements and then it can be reformulated, yes. All right, so that was, um, I'm afraid this is how much time we have <laughs> uh, at this stage. Um, we'll address the questions in writing uh, after the webinar. Yes, we'll, we'll try to answer as many questions as, po uh, as possible. We'll try to also post them on our blog. Well, thank you all very much for joining. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for uh, the presentation. It was a pleasure to have everybody here today. Um, we hope to hear from you offline and we hope to see you at our next event.